One of my best friends in college had lost most of his hearing when he was a little kid. And while he was in college, he got sick and he lost what little bit of hearing he had left and found himself completely deaf. But surgeons were able to give him a cochlear implant. And that restored his hearing. Now I can go and I can sit down in a crowded restaurant and have lunch with him. With the clanging of pots and pans and plates, with all the different conversations going on around us, with the music they play overhead, and I can sit and have a conversation with him just like I do with everybody else, and he can hear and understand every single word I say. We are making amazing strides in healthcare, and it's not just helping people hear again. If we look at the survival rates for people with the four most common types of childhood cancer, we can see that we've gone from tragedy to an era of healing and of hope. We have completely eradicated smallpox. We have almost completely eliminated the childhood scourge of polio. Just a couple decades ago, an HIV diagnosis was akin to a death sentence. But now, people can live for more than 50 years after they're diagnosed thanks to improvements in healthcare. This is just the beginning. Things are getting better. Scientists are continuing to develop new medicines. Advances in gene editing are bringing about the prospect of genetic therapy. And that can help cure diseases that we've never been able to treat before. Advances in robotics are bringing about the promise of bionic prosthetics to help people gain mobility again. Now, you can probably tell I'm a little bit excited about this kind of stuff. <laughs> can you tell that? So, but as excited and optimistic as I am about how science and technology are going to improve our lives and improve our health, I'm also acutely aware that our ability to help cure people, our ability to help treat people, our ability to keep people healthy is going to be severely limited by an age-old problem. Most people who get medical help, they're given medicine. Unfortunately, people just aren't very good at taking their medicine the way they're supposed to. This concept is known as medication adherence. Put simply, medication adherence is taking your medicine the way the doctor tells you to. Taking the right dose at the right time, taking it with food or on an empty stomach, take it half an hour before bed. We've all seen these instructions on a pill bottle. It seems so simple. So why is this a big problem? Well, people have a lot of demands on their attention. And a lot of people take more than one medication, and each one comes with its own set of different instructions. If we think of our own experiences, how many of us have been given a bottle of pills by our doctor? And the doctor says, take one of these every day until the bottle's empty. After a few days, it's working. We're feeling better. We really don't want to keep putting these strange chemicals in our body, so we stop taking the medicine, even though there's still pills in the bottle. How about the mornings when we're rushing to get to work or school on time, and we forget to take our medicine? Or we wake up, we take our medicine, we shower, we eat, we get dressed, we do all that, and then on our way out, we take our medicine, and oh, we just over-medicated ourselves. We can understand that this happens. But just because it's understandable, and just because we get it, it doesn't mean that it's not a huge problem. Not taking medicine properly causes countless hospitalizations. About 10% of all hospitalizations are because people didn't follow the directions when they're taking their medicine, 10%. It costs hundreds of billions of dollars in extra health care every year, money that could be spent on something else. Just in the United States, we spend over $300 billion a year in medical services to people because they didn't take their medicine properly. And most importantly, it kills people. About 125,000 Americans die every year because they don't take the medicine the way they're supposed to. This is such a pervasive and such an important issue that a report by the World Health Organization has suggested that improving medication adherence will have a bigger impact on healthcare outcomes than those amazing advances in treatment that we were talking about. 
For generations, doctors and researchers have been trying to address this problem, but they've only been able to make these small little incremental gains. But that was then. This is now. We're in the age of information technology. This is the era of smartphones, of big data, of the internet of things. So let's take some good old technological disruption and finally solve this problem. There have been some experiments and some pilot studies that use information technology to try to solve this problem. And many of them have had positive results. That tells us information technology can help. It can work. But this research has been scattered and it's been ad hoc. You have a team over here that has no idea what a research team over here is doing. And what's even worse, when you look at what they are researching, many of them are doing exactly the same study and getting exactly the same result that's been done over and over again, rather than taking what we've already learned and building on it to move us forward. What we need is a shared research agenda. We need a common playbook so we can all be on the same page so that what the research team over here does builds upon and will work with the technology that's been created by this team over here. To this end, my colleagues and I propose the 4R playbook. It is reminders, records, real devices, and research and development. Now reminders, these are reminder systems. They do exactly what it sounds like they do. They help us remember to take our medicine when we're supposed to. Some of them even let us, if it's a smartphone app, it lets us say, yes, I took my medicine. That actually reduces the likelihood we'll accidentally take it again and uh, give ourselves too much medication. But we can go beyond simply reminding people to take their medication. We can incorporate these where they go out through the internet, they reach into a database of medical best practices, and based on what we are doing, they become context aware. They become dynamic reminder systems so that if I'm out and about and I don't have my medicine with me, I can say I'm skipping this dose. It pulls from that database. It looks at best practices. What should I do? And it says, you know what? We're going to move your next reminder up two hours because that will have the best medical result for you. If it's sending reminders and we're simply not responding to them, when it gets too close to the next dose, it will stop sending the reminders automatically so we don't over-medicate ourselves. Now, some of these systems, like the one here, they keep a record of when you say you took your medicine. That can be incredibly useful for doctors. So when a doctor can see that record, they can, you can hand them your smartphone and say, oh, here, look at what I've done. It helps them make better decisions. They know whether or not you've been taking your medicine. They can see the patterns on how you take your medicine. Let's say someone is taking their medicine properly, but it's not having the expected benefit. Well, the doctor may up their dose, or the doctor may change tact and give them a different medicine altogether, because this simply isn't working for them. Conversely, the, for someone who isn't taking the medicine properly, the doctor may say, you know what? Let me explain just how important it is to follow these directions and take it as the instructions say to take it. Or the doctor may change tact, and instead of giving the patient another bottle of 60 pills to take one a day for the next 60 days, the doctor may say, you know what? I need you to come into my office once a week so I can give you a shot. But once again, we can go beyond this. We can go beyond simply showing the doctor a smartphone or having the doctor log in to a website with a password you give the doctor while you're in their office. We can integrate this detailed adherence information into their formal electronic medical record. And that way, not just that one doctor who gets a sneak peek at your smartphone, but all the doctors who are treating the patient and all the nurses and other healthcare providers who can use this information to make better decisions about how to treat you and how to care for you and how to bring about better health, they can all use this information to make those better decisions. Now, electronic medical records and smartphone apps, they're just bits and bytes. They exist somewhere out there in cyberspace. But these apps, these programs, they can also be linked to physical devices. Things that we call real devices, because they're out here with us in the real world. I'll give an example. There are smart medication boxes. These can be filled by a pharmacist. 
They remind us when it's time to take our medication, and they record when we open the box to take out our medicine. So that gives some good data. Researchers are going one step further. They're creating smart pills. The smart pills have a microchip in them. When you swallow it, that chip hits the acid in your stomach and sends a radio signal to your smartphone. So we know exactly when you took the medicine, not just when you opened the bottle. More and more of us are wearing smartwatches and our fitness trackers. They record an incredible array of vital signs if we let them. We can use them to record the physiological reaction we have when we take the medicine. You know, does our blood pressure spike when we take it? Our doctor would probably like to know that. There's other information our doctor would like to know that happens to our bodies when we take the medicine. The reality, a lot of stuff we won't even really notice. But that smartwatch will notice it and record it and share it with our doctor. So that way our doctor can take our individual response to that particular medication and use it to custom tailor our treatment to us and our individual response to the medication. Researchers are developing implantable devices. So an affiliate of Google is developing a contact lens to be worn by diabetic patients. It measures the glucose level in the person's tears. It sends a signal to an implanted insulin pump that releases the exact right amount of insulin at exactly the right time. And that can help the patient avoid the highs and lows in blood sugar that lead to long-term complications among diabetic patients. When we have apps to help us remember to take our medicine, when we have implanted devices that make sure we get the right amount of medicine at the right time, and to be honest, make it almost impossible to forget to take it, when we have our smartwatches and other wearable technology on us measuring how our bodies actually respond when we take the medicine, and when we put all this detailed data into our formal medical records, we're poised to transform the way we do medical research. We can put all of this into one big database that can be accessed by qualified medical researchers and scientists. They can use this big data to get insights that we otherwise would never get. We can find out that, hey, there are two medicines and they don't play well together. OK, so we know if someone's taking this medicine, do not also prescribe this medicine. On the other side of that spectrum, we can see that someone who is taking two medications may have dramatically better results than if you're just taking one or the other. That's important for doctors to know. And not just as a one person isolated example, but when you have thousands of patients and thousands of data points to pick from, that becomes incredibly valuable. We can discover that when people with a condition are given a certain kind of medicine to treat it, oh, it's also curing some other condition. Well, now we found a new use for that medicine that will help heal other people. And we're in a world where, fortunately, we have a lot of different medicines that can be used to treat just even one condition. But we can use this data to find out which one of those medicines actually works best for a specific type of patient. We'll prescribe them that. Why give them the thing that's going to be less effective for somebody like them? All of these insights will remain invisible to us unless we can put all this data together into that database. Let's get on the same page. Let's open up the same playbook so that we can actually work together so that we can build on it what each other do, so that we can save countless lives, save billions of dollars, and so that we can make the world a healthier and a happier place. Thank you. <laughs>